Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm exceptionally well, Rory. Thank you so much for asking. And we hope that you are well as you join us for the Counselling Tutor Podcast. This is episode 217. And today we've got three topics that we're going to be covering, starting off with our student check-in, where we are going to be going back to the basics uh, of counselling, the the underpinning theories and principles that sit at, sit at the base of any good counselling practice and today looking at a form of empathy named radical empathy. We then move on to the focus on self section where we recognise that you as a practitioner, you are the heartbeat of your practice and we need to look to ourselves in order to be there for our clients and today we're going to be looking at how you plan your CPD, your continuing professional development post-graduation. And then we go into Practice Matters. Practice Matters is the section where we dip our toe into the world of practice. We look at all elements of practice, including running a practice or maybe client presentations within our practice. And something really contemporary of the time as we make this recording uh, is bereavement in these COVID times, how people are coping with that, how we work with that. And Rory met up with Dr. John Wilson, uh, a leading expert who has shared some information and knowledge on this topic. So make sure you stick around for that amazing interview, a really good one there. But let's start this episode 217, uh, going back to those foundations of counseling, Rory, and looking at radical empathy. What's radical empathy? Well, I mean, I, I think it's it's a very good question, Ken. And I think it brings us back to what empathy is. It's entering someone else's frame of reference and trying to see the world as they see it, moment by moment experiencing. I guess that would have been Roger's take. But what happens if you're entering a frame of reference of someone you don't like or their behaviour is something you find uh, repulsive? How does that work? Can we offer empathy? And, you know, when we trained counsellors many years ago, Ken, when we sat in those circles, one of the things that came up time and time again was, I think I could offer empathy to everybody, but I don't think I could offer empathy to maybe someone who's a sex offender. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think that, you know, you could only do what you can do. There's no judgment there. I think that some people may not be able to do it, but... I've, I've worked with some very inspired counsellors who are able to work with people who have committed horrendous crimes. And the term radical empathy is a, it really does sum it up. They're able to enter the client's frame of reference and really push aside um, their own prejudices. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a big ask, Ken. It, radical empathy is a big ask. But I, I think that when people do it, um, you know, I, I take my hat off to them. They're they're really pushing and committed to their craft. Mm. We're talking about a, a, a very advanced form of empathy here. And you're 100% right, Rory, and kind of reflecting there what empathy is. And I guess mm. we all get that. And there are times when empathy will be challenging, um, even from our own frame of reference, how we see the world, we may see it differently to the person we're working with. We then kind of look at that unconditional positive regard. And we've spoken about that a number of times. And how do we balance that out with empathy? But radical empathy is more than that as well. So yes, it is working with things that may be challenging for you uh, and entering that client's frame of reference. But radical empathy can also be about entering the frame of reference of a person who might be unwell they may be psychotic they may have a frame of reference that is very warped from reality but it is how they see it uh, within psychosis a person will see the world perhaps very differently to how that world is because of a chemical imbalance or, or a neurological challenge that they're facing at that time how are we able to be empathic how are we able to see the world as they see it if they are seeing a perceived or warped world and and that is another area of radical empathy so radical empathy we're talking about the challenging aspects of empathy when empathy becomes challenging so yes it can be about us uh, maybe prejudices that we hold and we don't like to think we hold prejudice prejudices uh, but as human beings we generally if you look 
deep enough and you do enough enough self-seeking, you're going to find that we all have feelings and and, uh, ways of looking at things because of the road that we've challenged. So how do we be there for someone else where we might disagree with who they are, what they've done? But equally, how are we there with somebody when they are clearly unwell, but then still need an empathic connection to know that somebody is there, hearing them, listening to them? Do we pretend and go along with what they say they are seeing and say we see it too or is that colluding with the client and these are the challenges and again whenever we touch on a topic like this rory and i always put out that disclaimer we're not the experts on this we're really really not we're two colleagues we come together we have a chat about topics some of them challenging such as this one but it's about uh, you and your practice and what cpd you do and we hope that this will prompt a discussion that you might take to your colleagues that you might look into a little bit of cpd on yeah and and i i, I think that one of the things about empathy is it's, t- it's talking about shared possibilities so when you're working with a client you're you're in a realm of shared possibilities but with radical empathy, you may be working with someone where you don't hold their values. You don't hold their values. You don't hold the the possibilities <clears throat> that they are um, that they are thinking about. And that's certainly if you're working with someone um, who has, you know, very profound psychosis. And I, I, what I would say is that if if you know you you need to be highly trained and highly skilled and and very well supervised to do that. Um, but there isn't that shared possibility. So you're working in a frame of reference where you're not invested in it. Mm. And I think that I think that is a it is a it is a very, very, very big challenge. Um and it's it radical empathy is relatively, relatively a new idea. But there's a lot of therapists who are actively pursuing it because they want to be the best for all their clients. Um and I as I said, I think or I feel, I think it's I feel, that if you are going to investigate the radical empathy and and work with people whose value systems are really different to yours or their frames of reference are really, really different, is really to to get really good supervision and probably a bit more of it in my view. Yes. So I guess I guess it's the the if you're if you're entering into this realm of of needing to use radical empathy tread carefully make sure that you have the 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 qualifications make sure you're working within your competence and i guess you know we're looking here at foundations in counseling and this is certainly so we're we're going back to the very basics of counseling and this is certainly not something you would be working with uh, at that foundation level in counseling this is this is really uh we're, we're talking advanced empathy here however It is a conversation we can have at those foundations to discuss what it is so that you're familiar with it. Because part of working within within our competences is being able to see when our competences are are, are no longer serving us. When, you know, to to know I'm working within my competence, I need to understand what is working outside of my competence. And and, and radical empathy, certainly as a student or a, a, a counselor just in those early years, uh, is is uh, an area that you want to tread very lightly in. So, in in looking over the the information, doing my my research for speaking about this topic today, one of the things that I came across was that when working with radical empathy, we we have the empathic connection on the one side, but we might balance that empathic connection with a clinical distance. That there will be a connection but a difference. I don't know what that feels like. I don't feel qualified, I guess, to work with within that level. And I I don't suggest that in my practice, I haven't worked with challenging clients. I have, I've worked with clients uh, where their value system uh, um, definitely differs from mine. Uh, And I've kind of rested there in the unconditional positive regard Mm. area. Um, So I, I, I don't know what it feels like to have a clinical distance yet be connected, Rory. And I wonder what your thoughts might well, be. I think, I think it's really, really interesting. And you say that, you know, students, rightly so, you shouldn't be working with very complex cases. But here's the thing, Ken. You could be working with someone who has very, very different political opinions to you. Ooh. So you might work with someone who has a very different political frame of reference. And I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, we're becoming more politicized 
as a profession and as individuals. We see that in our Facebook page. And if you want to join our Facebook page, go to Facebook, type in Counselling Tutor. Uh, we're a closed group. Knock on the door and we'll invite you in our warm and caring um, people who look after our our site will let you in and you can join thousands of like-minded people who talk about the world of counseling and psychotherapy and one of the topics that does come up is the political ideas um, people having different political um, ideas and it may be you work with someone who has a different a, di a definite pol different political stance to you and i think that radical empathy uh, would be something that might be used at student level in, in those cases. But in terms of a clinical distance, and to answer your question, Ken, I think it is about not being sucked in to that mm -hmm. other person's frame of reference to the point where you become um, maybe groomed or you agree with them. I, 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 can, I know in my practice, and certainly as a student, I met people with very, very different outlooks on life. And I tried to be empathic and understand their frame of reference. But at the end of the session, I, I kind of sat and re-grounded myself in my values, perspectives, and my views of the world, and um, didn't lose that sense of self. And I think it's that as-if element, yeah. you know, that you're not you're not losing yourself in the service of empathy. Yeah, it's 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 such an interesting topic. And I'm, I'm glad we're discussing it today. Mm -hmm. You know, as we're going through this, you it, it may well be that, um, that that the radical empathy only shows itself once the relationship is, is formed that somebody might share something, uh, maybe that they've never shared with another human being. And you're the person you're the person hearing their story and and uh, Carl Jung said um, that the reason for evil in the world is that people are unable to tell their stories, you know, and empathy is about mm. being there and, and listening to somebody, no matter what it is they're saying. And, you know, that can be bringing up all kinds of stuff in you, but just listening, just being there, that is an empathic uh, um, attitude, I guess. And uh, in, in the handout, there is a, a reference. We'll tell you where to get that handout in a moment. There's a, there's a, a reference to the Yorkshire Ripper. And the Yorkshire Ripper uh, is hi historically in the United Kingdom is, is basically a serial killer. And, and, and it's about thinking. If you found yourself in, in that situation, I'm not suggesting you would put yourself in that situation, but does that person deserve to have a counsellor hear them? Does that person deserve empathy for them to tell their story, why they did what they did, how that made them feel, what was going on for them? Uh, difficult questions like, could you be that person? What would you need to put in place for yourself? And there is a great example of radical empathy. And we're talking now of a very extreme situation here, but it is a real life uh, situation there are many people that have done horrendous things and they can be carrying guilt they can be carrying shame they can be carrying remorse where do they take that is it that if you've done horrendous things in your life you don't deserve to be heard you don't deserve empathy or is that something that we can unconditionally grant to others and then of course there's the other side of that uh, um coin we've already spoken about someone who may be uh, ill but we can also talk about a chronic or really severe depression where a person doesn't see any way out where their frame of reference is just bleak and dark there is no hope whatsoever can we share in that frame of reference do we empathically get in to their shoes and look at it and go yes i hear that you see no way out i hear there is only darkness here how do we keep ourselves separate how do we not collude in that darkness when the person is sharing the only way out that i can see is taking my own life how do we deal with that and these are just the questions this is this is what this is about it's to get this this conversation going because these are real life presentations Absolutely, Ken. And I think if, if there's any lessons to be learned from history about radical empathy, we can look to Carl Rogers and his time at Wisconsin when he worked on something called the Psych Project, mm. worked with people with psychosis. And um, he became quite unwell working with one particular client. And I think nowadays, someone may have taken Carl onto one side and said, you know, Carl, maybe you need a bit more supervision. 
maybe just need to, you know, have a bit more self-care. And, and to be honest, in his later years, he did say he was getting a little better at looking after himself. Um, but it just goes to show even, even uh, you know, a luminary such as Rogers, who offered empathy. And, you know, he was the person who really brought this idea um, and, and kind of owned it for himself. Even he um, became, he became a casualty of yeah. over empathizing. So, you know, if you're thinking of going down that route, or you may be working with someone who's very different to you and you're finding it, um, you know, you're finding it draining supervision, you know, if you're a student, you know, your case discussion groups and, and self-care. Um, but sometimes it just goes, this kind of this radical empathy sometimes goes with the territory, I have to say. It does. I'm going to quote from the the handout that we'll share the link where you can get that in a moment. And it's uh, I'm reading now from that handout, just as Carl Rogers believed that empathy one of was one of the six and necessary and sufficient conditions for therapeutic personality change. So if one can acknowledge the possibility of a bad, very bad solution, for example, someone taking their own life, then one may be able to find a better solution, whether pharmacological, pharma cognitive, behavioral, or empathy based. In other words, being fully open to a client's whole experience, even when it's outside the therapist's experience, is difficult for them to understand. Um, likely to be helpful, though. So just being there. And, and kind of we end this by looking at an argument that is out there that says that there is no such a thing as radical empathy, that radical empathy is empathy. Mm -hmm. It's the same whether you call it radical empathy or non-radical empathy. Um, and, and that is an argument. It's covered in the, in, the, uh, um, in the handout as well, basically suggesting, you know, we're there for that person. So you're looking past whatever it is that they've done and who they are. And, and you're just recognizing that the thing that is the same there is a, a fellow human being in front of you, a fellow human being, and they have done what they've done. They believe what they believe because of the road that they've traveled or because they um, may have a neurological challenge or uh, they may be ill and, and, and suffering from something. And that true empathy is seeing through all of that, seeing through the actions of the person and just seeing the seed inside that is humanity, the thing that unites us and joins us. And in that that we can all and in that we can always find an empathic connection. Well, that is an argument. That is an argument for it. But this is your decision. It's your practice. It's your journey. What do you think about radical empathy? Yes. And I think there's no better way to end this segment on of the words of Terence, of course, the Greek philosopher who said, uh, you know, I am human, nothing human is alien to me. And I think that um, it's it's a heady axiom to live up to, but one that I think practitioners should keep in mind and, and try their best. Yeah, definitely. So we've spoken and referenced the handout. Uh, there is a great handout on radical empathy that you can get. It's free of charge. Um, and to get that, just go to our website, which is counselingtutor.com. That's our mother website. You'll find everything about Counselling Tutor, loads and loads of free stuff on that site, loads of free downloads. Our podcast is accessible there. To get this handout, go to counsellingtutor.com, click on the podcast tab, find your way to episode 217, that's 217, right there on the page. You can download the handout on Radical Empathy, and there ends our foundations uh, in therapy for today. And we move on to focus on self where we recognize that you as the practitioner, you are the heartbeat of your practice. And today we're speaking about planning your CPD. And I think Rory, before we speak about maybe the planning of the CPD, why would we do CPD in the first place? I mean, you, tra you train, you get a certificate that says that you can go out and start working. Have we not learned what we need to learn to be able to serve our clients? Straight answer, Ken. No. <laughs> oh, I didn't I, expect that. <laughs> no, no. I think I think if anybody thinks that they, they, they hold their shiny certificates up, I think they know everything. They they should take a long, hard look in the mirror, maybe. And 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 our profession is a growing profession. I qualified in two thousand and four. And if I look at look at the time between 2004 and where we are now, which is about 18 years, we know so much more about the human condition, how people think about 
you know, how what psychological states people are getting. We know a lot more about trauma. Legislation has changed. It's changed at a pace over over the last 18 years, different legislation. Um, and also, of course, we mustn't forget the rise of understanding race and culture within our society. That was hardly discussed. I think there's only Colin Largo who was writing anything when I was training. And now, of course, we have a plethora of, um, of societal discussions around identity and who we are. And I'm afraid that all of those things can't be squeezed into a three-year course. We have to learn them. So that is why we do continual professional development. And I haven't even touched on the, the changes in things like ethical frameworks and, yeah. and, and qualification levels. So, yeah, the, it, ours is a profession where learning never stops. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, what you a lot of the stuff you were speaking about there refers to kind of the management of your practice and your values within your practice and and that is very important in cpd as is areas of specialism you know client presentations a client comes in and shares a presentation maybe something you haven't worked with before are we able to best serve that client if we don't have an understanding of that presentation uh, and and how we might be working with that client. And uh, one of the examples that I use in, in my training, uh, we touched on self-harm in one lecture, which was probably 20 minutes out of close on five years of training. Uh, I ended up working in a, a college situation where it was a common presentation. And it was on me to go and do continuing professional development. It was it was on me to upskill myself in service of the, the presentations that my clients were bringing in. Uh, and I think we're called upon to do that. And, and there is an argument, of course, to say that if you're working from the person-centered uh, modality, that it doesn't matter what a person brings, you just offer those uh, six necessary and sufficient conditions. They are necessary and they are sufficient. But I think we're selling our clients short and, in t in, and we can be working in areas of danger. There are certain presentations that yeah. would be red flags uh, that would indicate uh, a need for referral uh, um, uh, or a, a, a hidden danger. Danger is not always prevalent. It doesn't always show itself. It can hide behind a certain presentation. And if we miss that, if we miss that because we hadn't skilled ourselves, that 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 um, that is sad, you know. So continuing professional development, uh, so so important. It's difficult to plan it because w w what do you do? When do you do it? How do you do it? You know, we're busy. We run a practice. We maybe have families. Uh, we've got a life. You know, I've got to take my dogs for a walk, Rory. I've got to spend time with my daughter and uh, uh, my passions outside of counseling. And uh, it's it, it, life gets busy. And what I found is that doing CPD can almost be a chore. Oh, I've got to do CPD because my ethical body uh, requires that I evidence a certain amount of, of hours of CPD each year. I'm glad they do. And I think it's sad when we go to CPD as a chore to tick a box to evidence that we've done it, rather than with passion and enthusiasm to serve our clients better. And I'm not pushing this out on anybody. This is about me. And it's about me looking at myself. And I'm very glad now that uh, I do my CPD now uh, with passion and vigor. I want to do it. I want to learn for my clients. Absolutely, Ken. And I guess we're in a fortunate position because doing what we do, every day is a CPD day. <laughs> Literally every day is a CPD day. I spend hours in papers and research and um, all sorts of things and, 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 and watching videos and uh, attending seminars and things like that. So, so it, it becomes really part of your life. And I think the thing with CPD is to think of it as the best way of serving your clients. You've touched on that, Ken. And my, all my CPD, I'll be really honest, has been driven by what my clients have brought. And when I've gone to my supervisor, realizing that there's, there's, there's a gap there. And I think one of the very concerning things, and, and thankfully one of the things now that um, 
directory listings, those, those, those of you who sign up to a, a, a listing to advertise your services, there's quite a few of them about. Some of them have a tick box that you can literally tick 30 specialisms. I'm an eating yeah. disorder specialist, body dysmorphia, tick. I can do uh, child therapy, tick, 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 tick. And thankfully, a lot of these organisations are now saying, that's fine, if you tick the box, can you just send us your, your qualification? Yeah. And I think that is a principal position. And also, I think it is in great service of the general public. One of, one of the biggest complaints that ethical bodies get is people working beyond their competence. And, you know, we're not in 1957 in, you know, or 1959, maybe in, you know, California with Rogers and Byrne and all these people. <laughs> Uh, you know, if Rogers came back today, he would be absolutely fascinated about how our understanding of the human condition has, has, you know, literally accelerated since since his death in, 19, in 1985. He, he would be really excited. He, he, he would probably be changing his theories. And I think we can't sit in all our roles. And planning our CPD, I think, is really important. And here's the thing, Ken. People think of CPD as having to take two days to go to a seminar and or maybe doing a 30 hour course. And but it's not. There's lots of ways people can get continual professional development, isn't there? Yeah. And and <laughs> ironically, ironically, you're doing CPD right now. Oh, there you Listening to this podcast, you can write it down as CPD. You you can. We speak about topics that are related to counseling, that are related to growth. Um, and related to practice and serving clients. And, and that's what CPD is about. So you can certainly, if you're a regular listener to the Counseling Tutor podcast, pop it down as, as CPD. Um, I, it would be concerning if that was all of your CPD, because as Rory and I say all the time, we're not experts, we're just no. two colleagues having discussions, but we prompt you uh, to, to kind of uh, take those discussions further and to do CPD or research around maybe some of the topics that come up that interest you. Um, so there, there's one area of, of, of CPD. If you are a member of an ethical body that has a regular um, magazine that they send around, read their articles. There's some more CPD that you're doing in service of your clients. You know, just sitting reading um, for, a f for a few hours every now and again, uh, put it down as CPD. Uh, there are a number of uh, CPD libraries or CPD providers out in the market. And there's no secret uh, counseling tutor. Uh, so Rory and myself, we, we run a qualified practitioner CPD library. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of qualified practitioners who choose to remain a member of that CPD library. And it's really interesting. We've got a team of 14, uh, uh, a team of 14 people that that work around that CPD library. And when we have meetings, we, we meet remotely uh, because of the times we're in and we, we, we check in over Zoom. And the thing we check in with uh, with every meeting is what CPD we're doing because we 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 want to be practicing the the principles and the values uh, that that we try to kind of radiate out. And our academic writer, um, who is a lovely lady, and she's been writing for us uh, for many years. She's a researcher and academic writer. She's a very highly qualified uh, therapist working in the NHS uh, in a number of modalities. And uh, her check in was, you know. My CPD is doing all the academic writing. I'm I'm touching on so many different topics and having to research and write about those that that makes up a, a large part of my CPD. We have guest lecturers in, and we try we try to get the experts in the field. We go to the luminaries. We go to people who specialize in a certain area. We have professors. We have doctors. We just have specialists of people that have done things for a long time that come and do lectures for us, uh, and all of those lectures go into the CPD library. And when you think about cost of that, um, the cost to join our CPD library is it's the same cost if you take an annual membership as having a cup of coffee with a friend every month. One cup of coffee with a friend is what it costs. And if you think about it, if you had a question, let's say I'm just going to pick an example here around assessment. I'm just taking assessment here. And I'm going to refer to John Miller Clark, who, who is w w one of the founding team of the core assessment uh, protocol and papers and, and, and system 
And um, if you could sit down and have a coffee coffee with him about assessment and get all of his best knowledge, would that be worth the price of that cup of coffee? Because that's what our CPD library offers. And this is not an ad for the CPD library. There's online events that offers great CPD as yep. well. There's a number of great providers out there. This is not an ad. That's not what this is about uh, to pitch it. But I, I would be remiss not to let you know that it is available. And if you're interested in the Counselor CPD Library, just go to counsellingtutor.com. All the information's on the page right over there. But plan your CPD, do it in service of your clients. Um, when a client comes in with a certain presentation, maybe somebody comes in, they mention they're neurodiverse, they have autism, go and go online, go, go and learn about it and, and uh, un understand how to work with this person in service of your clients. Absolutely. And I think that supervisors out there need to put CPD on the supervision agenda. I know when I'm supervising, I will say to my supervisors, so what, what CPD are you planning to do? And maybe work with them. You know, you've had quite a few presentations around bereavement, you know, and, and, and you know, one of your clients is quite complex. What, what have you, what CPD have you done on bereavement? Maybe worth investigating something like that. And I think sometimes as a supervisor, just helping your supervisees um, de de develop their practice, build their, what I refer to as professional formation, just by suggesting CPD events. And they're, they're great. And you, you can meet some fantastic people. I've met some fantastic people doing CPD courses, people that I'll stay in contact with forever. And it's, it's so, so important. And I think that if you're feeling it's a bit of a, a drag and it's just a box ticky exercise, then maybe there's a period of reflection there for you to sit mm -hmm. down and reflect and say, you know, what's, what's going on? Cause I know when I see my doctor, <laughs> I would like to see my, my GP who does, who, who does a lot of CPD in the medical profession. I would hope that he or she is right at the top of their profession yeah. and, and hasn't sat down and thought, well, I'll just do this on, you know, whatever whatever ailments I have and has entered entered the learning with passion and commitment in the service of their patients and we should do that in the service of our our clients and as I say um one of the benefits in my final views on this one of the benefits of CPD is you can learn a lot about your practice but you can learn a heck of a lot about yourself mm, learn more about yourself than yeah. the more the more you learn about your practice and your clients the more you learn about yourself yeah. I'm really glad you ended this um this section, Rory, speaking about supervision, and you spoke about it from the supervisor's perspective. We, we train supervisors, and it's a really important part in our training is that formative side of the supervision triangle where you are informing who the supervisee, where the supervisee can, can be doing that, that uh, development in service of their clients. But if you're not a supervisor, then you are quite right to go into your supervisor and say you know what i had a client who presented with this where can i find cpd have you got any recommendation go go and take your your questions around your cpd to yeah. your supervisor and work it through with with a with a with a fellow professional who is there to serve you and your clients you know go to your supervisor it's so when you're speaking about your client load and a, and a presentation that you may uh, that may have come up or an area where you may feel de-skilled ask your supervisor say where, where can i learn more about that mm -hmm. where can i learn more about that and your supervisor may not know but they can maybe find out and key into their network speak to your peers about um uh where where you can do specific training uh learning uh, maybe they've done a course maybe they've watched a lecture maybe they've read an article and an academic article on something um, there's a lot of information there asking for help. And, you know, Rory mentioned our Facebook group. That's a great place to ask questions. Yeah. We would never say, I've got a client who came in with such and such, where can I learn more? Because we don't speak about clients. But you can say out of interest, anybody know any great bereavement resources? Uh, yes. You know, that is a that is a, an acceptable question. And you'd be so surprised at uh, the help and support of doing it together rather than alone. Ah, there you go, CPD. Absolutely, Ken. And uh, and in, in fact, we did CPD making this podcast because we had to we had to have a look at all the resources and, and yeah. look at them, and we've actually got some podcasts. So yeah, I think moving on from 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 the focus on self and planning your CPD, 
and talking about experts, Ken. Yeah. Talking about experts. This is CPD, isn't it? When, CPD. When practice matters. That's the section where we look at your practice and specialist areas, things that may come up in practice. Rory, you spoke uh, to Dr. John Wilson, a leading expert on bereavement, but just not any old bereavement. No. I mean, I think it's not gone unnoticed that the COVID pandemic has had many, many impacts on individuals and none so profound as those who have lost loved ones during the time of COVID, not being able to see them or say goodbye. And this has brought a new form of presentation into the therapy room where people are talking about this, this kind of new and I use the word respectfully, unusual form of loss, not being able to see a loved one. And I caught up with Dr. John Wilson, who is an absolute expert in the area of bereavement. And we had a chat about bereavement in the time of COVID. And this is what he had to say. And we welcome John Wilson, who is a tutor, an author, and dare I say it, an expert in bereavement. So Dr. John Wilson, thank you so much for joining us. Do you mind if I call you John? Not at all. I'm pleased to be here, Rory. Thank you. Thank you. So we, what, we, what we're looking at today is the, is, is the peculiarity, if, if that's the right word, of COVID and how it's affected bereavement and the kind of presentations that therapists are likely to encounter from those who have lost relatives during covid we had a bit of a conversation um before we started to record and some of the stories are quite harrowing aren't they john yeah it, it, very harrowing yeah but very hard to listen to quite heartbreaking yes so what what is the what is the difference if we need that explaining but what is the difference between a, a if i can use the term a normal bereavement and a bereavement during COVID, what what are therapists likely to experience within their client group for those clients who've been bereaved during the the COVID epidemic? Well, I think we're likely to um, experience greater levels of trauma um, because if you are able to be at a bedside in an intensive care unit at the end of somebody's life, that's going to be traumatic. A lot of people have been excluded uh, from intensive care units and maybe if they're lucky they've seen images on, a, on an iPad or, or on, on a phone and that's traumatic as well. People are likely to experience guilt, um, guilt that they didn't give somebody the funeral that they'd always promised, um, guilt that they didn't give them the, the, the send off guilt that they weren't able to visit in hospital to say goodbye so so guilt is a considerable factor but i think the biggest one um for counselors is the difficulty in helping people make sense of their grief and and certainly all the research particularly the research done by robert niemeyer uh, makes it very clear that in order to resolve grief you do need to make sense of the loss it appears to be one of the most important factors if not the most important. And so it's very difficult to make sense of a loss if you weren't there and you're reliant on sort of stories, other people's stories and piecing the bits together. And the danger of trying to do that and not being able to get there is that you have the added complication of rumination kicking in. So all in all, um, it, it's, a, it's a very different kind of loss to what we might call normal uh, circumstances. Yeah, so when you talk about rumination, what, what might that look like in the individual? It, it looks like uh, people going round and round in their head, often in the middle of the night, trying to make sense of something, and the brain just keeps us going over and over the same stuff, uh, and, it, and it's not helpful. Um, we often need to teach our clients ways to... Um, to stop ruminating and often meditation is the answer to that. Um, or we, we help our clients um, make sense of the information that they've got. Uh, and it can be quite a slow process. There's a lot of patience on the part of the client and the therapist. 
but but rumination is something really important to to avoid. I, I've I've discovered that over many years of research. So the it, scenarios and images going through someone's mind, yeah, playing out different things. Yeah, it, what could I have done differently? That kind of stuff. Yeah, what yeah. can I have done differently? Yeah. And and I'm sure, and I, you know, I'm I'm aware that there may be people listening to this podcast who, who have lost loved ones, um, mm. you know, during the COVID, you know, the COVID ep- epidemic. Yeah. But I, I wonder if I wonder if there's a, a sense of regret, the regret that it wasn't the opportunity maybe to say a few words and clear things up and and just make peace with the past, not being able to see someone before they died. Yes, a huge problem, particularly where well, I've talked to people who've had ambivalent relationships with the person that's uh, died and, and things are left hanging. And so, yeah, a huge problem. And, and, you know, maybe there's sometimes we maybe have to do empty chair work to kind of resolve these things or, you know, work on continuing bonds. So, you know, we have got a whole number of theoretical models of grief that in our armory that we can work with, but you know, we do need to be very creative sometimes in doing this and finding the best way forward. I, yeah, and I, I, I think that you, you've already kind of given us two, um, two ideas of being creative. One, yeah. one is relationship bonds, and the other is empty chair. I wonder if you could say a little bit about relationship bonds. How would the therapist work with relationship bonds in cases um, like this? Well, I mean, I, I do a lot of work. Um, on social media, we have a Facebook group. And when somebody new comes into the group um, and talks about their loss, talks about the person they've lost, um, one of the very early questions that I will ask is, tell us about, tell the group about that person. So that ability to kind of relate and say what they were like, um, uh, what was their particular you know, features and qualities that uh, you remember, and really useful in, in counselling sessions to invite people to bring photographs, bring photograph albums, talk about the past. So all these are kind of early ways of creating that continuing bond. And some people do it very easily. I was talking to somebody um, this week who, who gave us a lovely, lovely clear picture of what their husband had been like. Um, and, you know, these things immediately start to help. Yes, it almost feels like kind of relating the story or the story of the relationship yeah. is, is, very, is very helpful. What, yeah. Why do you think that's important? What does it allow the bereaved person to get or to experience? Well, I think sometimes people have this idea that, um, you know, they've gone. Uh, they've gone and they're never going to come back and people quite often are frightened of forgetting their voice, forgetting what they sounded like. Um. And I think there's something about the continuing bond that enables you to realise that although they've left this earth, even if you're not religious, even if you don't believe in an afterlife, uh, those memories are always with you and love never dies. Love is always with you. And so it's a way of kind of creating a new symbolic relationship, which can be incredibly meaningful. And uh, as I often say when I'm when I'm teaching, um, I had an ambivalent relationship with my father. Now, I, you know, I'm closer to him now than when he was alive. I certainly love him a lot more than I did because there were things about him that were quite, you know, they were misogynistic and didn't treat my mother well and so on. And those things, um, when I've kind of worked on a continuing bond with him, um, it's about understanding why he was like he was. There were lots of reasons and to be much more charitable. So sometimes people's relationship in the continuing bond uh, improves ambivalent relationships. It, it almost sounds, certainly in your case, that the, the, this working on the, the bond with your father yeah. almost, almost kind of brought a forgiveness, allowed yes. you to, to maybe to understand his position and, and to... And to not to excuse it, but to kind of explain it and maybe some forgiveness in there. Is that the right word, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, in my case, I don't know if it's forgiveness. I think it's more understanding, feeling much more charitable. Um, I don't think there was anything to forgive, really, because he didn't do any of it deliberately. It was just how he was uh, and, and kind of 
looking at his history and his past and the way he was brought up, that they're things that um, I understand more now. And I've, I've helped clients with ambivalent relationships to, to understand. And it's not necessarily about forgiveness, but it is about uh, understanding that person. Yes, and and I think that can be quite quite important, can't it? Because, yeah. you know, in my experience as a therapist, sometimes individuals struggle with the fact that they've got ambivalent feelings towards the person who's died. Yeah. And and sometimes it's about working it through. It, yes. it can be quite a relief, can't it, when somebody, as you have done, um, mm. says, well, I, I kind of understand where that person came from now. Yeah, yeah. I'm also thinking, um, and my thoughts were driven by hearing a quite a harrowing encounter of somebody <clears throat> who um, had a loved one who died and they, the family had to choose um, which relative actually went by the bedside and, and, and said their final goodbyes. Yeah. And it kind of struck me, and we talked about this before we, we recorded this, that I'm I'm guessing that therapists have to be thoughtful of vicarious trauma when working with such harrowing material. They do. And, and, and as I said to you before we started recording, when I was writing a chapter on, on COVID grief and, and collecting stories, and um, people just wanted to tell their story because they were so angry about the way the pandemic had been handled. So, and, and I had to start limiting myself to, you know, to absorbing three or four stories a day it was just it was just so harrowing and I and I found myself in in tears a lot of the time and I found my pulse rate increasing so we do need to practice self-care uh, and, and I think we we need to really think carefully and reflect and use our own internal supervisors about the effect that the work is is having on us um and we need good supervision as well for that very reason so yes it, it it's it's it, the vicarious traumatization of stories of COVID is a is a real issue. Yes, and and I think I think also that um, I, I say I think I what I really mean to say I wonder if that's compounded when people work online as opposed to face to face. Do you know that's a good question, Rory? And and to be honest, I don't know. Um, I mean, I've been working online now since April. 2020 and I've talked to various clients some of whom I was seeing face to face before then and I think we've tended to agree that it isn't actually that much different um, and I think if you've got the kind of if you've got the personal skills to develop that relationship online it does seem to be okay but I think it's um you know, it's something that we need to be very care sure about. And I think we sometimes need to kind of check in with clients. How is this working online? Particularly if we've worked with them face to face beforehand. Yes, because I guess endings can be quite brutal online, can't they? Yes. they yeah. You know, there's not that kind of slow decompression that we would see um, in a face to face encounter where you may walk someone to the door or, no. um, you know. That's right. And, yeah. and also, I guess, I guess people don't get the chance in, in online to maybe you know walk, you know, walk to the car, catch the bus, have have some decompression time. Um, if they're in their own homes, they're kind of left with it where they are. Yes, and I think I think sometimes in the last few minutes, we need to check out what they're going to be doing and how they're going to manage that when when we when we sign off. I think it's a it's a good point because. Um, and I used to work in a hospice and people had a walk to the car park uh, and had a walk through reception and I would see them to the door and then they'd get to the, to the car park. And sometimes they would sort of sit in the car for a few minutes and they'd tell me the next session that they had a few tears in the car before they drove off. And I think we do need to kind of, if we're working online, check out with clients, you know, um, are you going to be able to give yourself a break before you you know, go back into the world after we've signed off. Yes, absolutely. And maybe that's, that's you know, forms a good practice point. Yeah. I know I certainly do it when I'm working with clients to be thoughtful that uh, they, they're not getting that, they're not getting that um, area of decompression. And yeah. it might yeah. be useful to do that actually yeah. in session. 
As we come to the end of this interview, John, I just wonder if you've got any observations for therapists who are working with the bereaved from COVID. Any kind of practice points or any kind of pleas to <laughs> to therapists to yeah. for themselves or indeed their clients? Yes, I think it's about um, being very patient, working slowly. I, I personally have never worked over time-limited counselling with bereavement. Um, some clients only need two or three sessions. Some need many, many sessions. Uh, my personal uh, average is is uh, is around about nine sessions. Um, most clients I see have six sessions or less. Um, but COVID, I think, is going to be very different. So we do need to be very patient, work slowly, help clients to make sense of what's happened. But there needs to be a point where we need to be able to say, you're not going to get any more than this. Um, you know, maybe it's time to say, I'm going to stop searching for something I'm never going to find. And there's something there to be negotiated. And then I think the other thing is just let's let's see what models of counselling we have in our armoury that we can use. So, for example, people need to take time out from their grief. The dual process model is really helpful for that. Some people, as we've said, need continuing bonds, uh, adapting to a new world. So Tom Attigs, I found some people like that idea of relearning the world, and that's very helpful. Um, and then, of course, the other thing to point out to clients, and, and they really um, home in on this, is just how your world has been changed. So assumptive world theory, Colin Murray Park's work, really, really helpful. So I think a lot of it is about psychoeducation, being patient, uh, and um, working at a client's own speed. And most of all, recognising that grief is unique and you're not going to meet the same the same grief twice ever because of that uniqueness and working with that. Well, on those incisive insights, John, Dr John Wilson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our guest, Dr John Wilson. Thank you to you, Rory, as always, for reaching out to John, having the, 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 the conversation and bringing that really important information to us. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting times, you know, and we, we have to work in the times we're in. I think that it just keys into what we were saying earlier about CPD uh, and it being relevant to what is going on and how we can't just rest on the laurels of core, cha uh, core training because times change and we need to move with them because our clients certainly do this has been episode 217 of the counseling tutor podcast yes we started with counseling foundations and radical empathy talking about going that extra mile and maybe working with people whose values are and experiences are very different from your own we moved on to focus on self talked about planning your cpd and indeed the cpd you're doing right now hearing my dulcet tones and then finally we went to practice matters an interview with dr john wilson an expert in, in the area of bereavement, talking about bereavement in the time of COVID. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe.